Well, hello, everybody. Um, it's a little bit after, a couple of minutes after 12, so we're going to get going um, and welcome you to this family education webinar provided by the Family Medical Coping Initiative here at Boston Children's Hospital. We are so glad you're all here to join us. And just so you know, the Family Medical Coping Initiative is a program through the Hale Family Center for Families at Boston Children's. And it's a multidisciplinary effort spearheaded by psychology, social work, and child life. And the program was developed to provide education to families and to staff about ways to enhance child and family coping with the impact of children's medical conditions, medical procedures, and interactions with the healthcare environment. Today's webinar is presented by the Family Medical Coping Initiative team, and I'm delighted to introduce my colleagues, Dr. Elisa Bromfman, who is a psychologist who's been working with medically ill children at Boston Children's for 24 years, and Gail Windmuller, who is a certified child life specialist, who's been at Boston Children's working with a wide variety of patients for more than a decade. And I'm Annie Banks. I am a social worker in the Hale Family Center for Families at Children's. And I've been working with families in medical settings for 30 years. I'm going to be monitoring your questions in the chat today. Um, so feel free to send them along during the presentation or we'll have a question answer period, um, hopefully last 10 minutes. And we may not be able to answer your questions about your own individual circumstance. Um, but we welcome questions about the topic in general. And if we don't get to all of your questions here, we'll follow up with you via email sometime after the presentation. So for administrative reasons, that can take a little while, but we will absolutely uh, follow up with you. And this presentation is being recorded and a link to the recording will be sent to you within several days of the presentation. And with all of that said, let's begin because we have a lot of ground to cover. So what are we going to talk about today? Um, we're going to discuss why children are anxious about medical visits and how do you identify your child's worries. Also preparing for medical visits, including helpful things to do and things to avoid, uh, making a game plan for the visit, which is really important, including when to tell the child about the upcoming visit, who should tell the child about the visit, what to say about the upcoming visit, and, and who should attend that visit with the child. Um, also some things about what to do during the actual visit, uh, building coping skills after the visit and determining when psychotherapy would be helpful when the level of anxiety is significant enough to think about therapy and we'll also offer some resources that we hope will be helpful for you so why are children anxious about medical visits i mean studies have shown uh, that children dislike or fear going to see medical providers for a host of reasons see if you see your child in this list but um, negative previous experiences um, fear of shots or pokes, as we like to say, is a less threatening word. Stranger anxiety, discomfort with medical environments, including the sensorial aspects like sights, smells, sounds, um, unusual equipment, unfamiliar language and misunderstandings about what some medical language might mean. Certainly discomfort with body touching, nudity, personal questions, fear of having an illness fear of unpleasant recommendations being told that they um, should do certain things like eat or not eat certain things, take medicine, do exercises, things that they might not want to do, and also exposure to ne negative images of medical situations in the media. Just look at any show on television, medical show on television. <laughs> So what is your role as a caregiver? I mean, first and foremost, it's identifying what your child's worries are specifically. And that means spending the time to listen and understand and we'll give you some tools for how to figure out what your child's worries are. Because um, learning why your child is anxious will have everything to do with the plan you develop about how to address those anxieties. Um, and your role is to support your child before, during, and after the visit. So how do you know if your child is anxious? 
Um, certainly with older kids, you know, they can often talk with you about what's going on for them, but not always. Um, so it's really important to observe certain things about children to see if they're anxious. Signs of acting younger, such as wetting when toilet trained already or stranger anxiety, sleep disruption, eating changes or disruption, if the child is easily frustrated and impatient, uh, crying when there's no apparent reason, um, need for parent support more than usual if your child is a little clingier than usual, um, a new fear of school or daycare, and fears related to maybe a past visit. Um, for instance, if a practitioner wore a white coat and if the child is frightened seeing people in white coats, um, or if driving past the building where the medical visit was, the child appears to be scared or cry, um, or they respond to certain smells that might be associated with the medical visit. And now I'm gonna turn things over to Elisa. Well, thank you, Annie. So uh, every child is different. So the specific worries that you identify will guide your plan, uh, the plan you make for your child. So we're talking about children who are developmentally young here. And for those that are younger, developmentally younger, uh, oftentimes play is a good way to identify what their concerns are. And uh, if you have items like a medical kit or a stuffed animal or dolls at home, that can also be very helpful. Uh, part of it is while you even in the context of play saying what's going to happen at the visit? What, what do you, how do you think your doll would feel about that? What else might happen at the doctor? These are the kinds of questions you can ask, but you're also use your observational skills. If they play with a medical kit and they're very roughly using a stethoscope with their, to with their toy bear, that might be interesting. Uh, we had a child who um, was talking about their diabetes and the way they said it, it seemed like they were thought that diabetes was diabetes as though you would die, just explaining that that's not the meaning of the word and sort of figuring out what your child, how they're playing, how they're thinking about their medical needs. So when you're older, play is still a factor for older kids in terms of what you, how you see them and how you talk to them, how you identify what they're worried about. And talking to older children and playing with older children, you can also make observations about what they're thinking. Uh, kids who are older often speak more when you're driving in a car or doing something like watching a show or playing a game. And when you're talking to them about the broad topics you might talk to a child about, such as their interests, friends, their bodies, medical situations, all of these kinds of conversations, you can pay attention and listen responsibly to how they think about their health and the medical world, even when those comments seem random or unrelated to, to um, what's going on. So they might ask a question like, why does everything always go wrong? Obviously, that's the kind of question we want to pay attention to. Um, I had a child who asked me these two questions, so I'm bring them up in particular. One is, what if the doctor didn't get a good night's sleep before my surgery? Uh, another child asked, what, asked me, and, and in, in the context of play and talk, had said, what if they put in the wrong heart valve? So these are the kinds of questions to let you know right away what their worries are. So why identify these specific concerns? Well, because we think it's gonna be important in how you address them and how you make your child feel better about, the, about uh, coming in for an appointment or an appointment that's already happened. Part of it is your own observation about what their experience has been in the medical world. You know if they love coming to the hospital because they enjoy looking at the fish, or if they love, um, or they love coming because they get to play a special game or have a special magazine. Um, those are things that you notice about how they react. But if also they're fearful every time or some unexpected blood work has happened every time, you know what their experience has been and bring that to the table, your own, your own knowledge of that. And also your own knowledge of how they've behaved in medical appointments before. The best predictor to, for future behavior is past behavior. So if they run out of the room or hide under the table uh, the last five times, it's likely that's what will happen again, unless you intervene about that. Also um, consider what your child's perspective might be and how they might think about it. It's, it's Sometimes it's hard to remember how the world was as a child ourselves, but that can often help to see how they might see it. So how do we respond when children express, directly express their fears? 
One is to acknowledge and not dismiss their fear. So let's say they're afraid of an upcoming physical therapy appointment. If they say, I'm so scared, I don't want to go. Um, we, you know, it's tempting to say there's nothing to be afraid of. They've been nice before. Don't, there's nothing to worry about and not talk about it. So dismissing those feelings doesn't actually help them feel better. So if you can acknowledge them, but then we're asking you to go through the eye of a needle in terms of not over emphasizing their fear, but having a confident and upbeat manner about talking about what could happen. So let's say they say, I'm afraid of that PT appointment. You could say, yes, it, it, it does, it's kind of scary. How come you're afraid or what are you afraid about? And then try to manage your own reaction and say, well, you know, let's see what we can do to make that feel better for you. And throughout this talk, we're going to be thinking about ways and strategies you can use to help your child feel better when you know what their fear is. And sometimes when it's hard to figure that out as well. So that's what we're talking about. So using these specific fears to determine what to focus on. So in the example of the child who's afraid about um, the doctor not getting a good night's sleep and, um, and also uh, maybe they'll use the wrong heart valve, that, that knowing that really helps you decide what you're gonna do to make that better. And each child is different. So you're gonna have a different plan for each child. But in the case of this child, what we did is she actually drew a cartoon out for me of what her fears were the not having slept enough and also the wrong heart valve. And then it was helpful to sort of think, wow, all right, how can you figure out, how do, how do they know what the right heart valve is to use and to talk to directly to her provider about that, show that. And actually there was a very warm moment where she advocated for herself and says, I'm afraid, this is what I'm afraid about, where they explained very clearly the hospital ways of knowing that you have the right uh, part. And as in, as in we were talking earlier, and like it's how do they know which arm you should uh, do a procedure on is they're going to mark it and they're going to they're going to be sure they're going to that's how they know they're doing the procedure in the right place. We want kids to have medical coping confidence. That's our mission here um, in our program is to have kids feel better and feel like they're managing their own care and have some control over what's going on in their lives, uh, including in a medical setting. So a couple of things to avoid um, to increase your child's future success. Uh, it's very tempting if your child has been crying, screaming, or running away during a medical appointment to punish them after the fact. Uh, but if you can um, keep what happened in Vegas in Vegas, as they say, um, if they misbehaved in the appointment, let it remain in the appointment and then have them go home, not to more punishment, because that just reminds them that they didn't do well and also makes their fear of it extend to not only fear of what's going to happen into the appointment, but fear of disappointing you and fear of that punishment after the fact. So I'm um, keeping, um, you can say, hey, let's try to make it better next time, but we'd prefer no punishments for behavior during the appointment. Also, um, threat shots and other um, procedures are very scary to children. So sometimes people are tempted to say, um, if you don't put your dishes away, I, we're going to get an extra shot or an extra immunization. If you can avoid those, um, those kinds of threats and also can sometimes use their providers as rule enforcers. I'm going to tell so-and-so that you ate that, or I'm going to tell so-and-so you didn't listen, whichever provider you're speaking about, trying to keep it all positive and not have uh, the providers as people who are fearsome in some way. And also not to tease your child for medical fears. And sometimes it's subtle what's teasing. Sometimes kids do something that's really cute and uh, it's very adorable with how they show their fear, uh, but uh, not to tease them openly or show that openly to other people if you can avoid it. But what do you do? So how do you help your child gain confidence? Uh, first of all, encourage them that the, the both that they'll be okay, but also that they have some skills to make this work, that they're getting older and they can manage it. Uh, assure them that you'll stay with them, that you'll be with them as much as, uh, for as long as you will be, and that you'll provide comfort in a way that makes them feel good and safe. So if they love reading books, you and, and that's something you can bring with you, you can say, while we're waiting, I'll read you a book, I'll be there with you. Uh, though Picking what, something that would fit for them as a way to make them feel better and more confident. And also, um, after the fact, look for something your child did well at the appointment even if that's all you can say is that they completed the appointment. Uh, let them know that you're proud of that specific thing. I can tell it was hard, but I saw that you tried. I liked the way you squeezed my hand tight. You cooperated in taking your shoes off and that was helpful. You answered the person's questions, whatever it is, see if you can find that positive thing. Now I turn it over to my colleague, Gail.
Hi, thank you. So um, one way to help children with dealing with medical situations is exposing them to medical situations in your home. Um, playing out medical situations at home um, can make kids feel more comfortable. Um, play is how children learn. And if you do what we call medical play, which is play about a medical situation, it's helping them process the, the medical situation and understand better what happened or what is going to happen. So having, for example, um, a set of um, uh, a medical, like a doctor's kit and a stuffed animal. Um, kids can pretend they're the doctor and you can watch and see how they, as, as Elisa said, you can watch and see how they interact with these things to know if they're anxious about it, but also to teach them what the different instruments are for. Sometimes kids don't realize what the stethoscope is for and you can explain that it's so that the doctor can make sure that your breathing sounds good and that your heart sounds good. Um, the other thing you can do is read books about um, bodies and medical visits. And at the end, we have a whole list of suggested books and uh, that, that you can um, look at. You can also go to your public library and find them um, and take a look at them. There are TV shows. One, of, one example is Doc McStuffins. Um, Doc McStuffins is a cartoon um, about a, it's a, a doctor who is examining her stuffed animals. And it's very cute and it's a very positive, um, feel good cartoon about the doctor. Um, Another thing you can do is model healthy coping skills. So for example, if you've been to the doctor and say you go to a physical therapist and you have to do exercises, you can say, you know what? I My doctor told me I need to do these exercises to make my legs stronger. So I'm gonna do that. And he's trying very hard to help me get better. And so I'm gonna do what he says to do or I'm supposed to take this medicine to make me feel better. So I'm gonna take the medicine. So talking about your own situation in a positive way and how you are coping with your medical needs can help children realize that it's not just them, it's everybody. And that it also sets a good example of how to face what you have to do. Um, outside of the home, you can also um, in some situations, you can invite the child to come with you to your appointment or a sibling's appointment. You need to think about what kind of appointment would be appropriate um, for your child and their age and whether or not their sibling would be comfortable. But if there's a situation that works and the sibling, for example, is older and has a lot of self-confidence about a doctor's appointment and doesn't mind the, sibling, the younger sibling coming, that's a great way to set an example for how to behave at the doctor's office and how to feel self-confident about going to the doctor. So another strategy um, for doctor's visits and in life in general is engaging in relaxation practice. Um, it, there are different ways to talk about breathing with children. Uh, one example is if you, Pretend you have a bowl of soup and you're gonna smell the soup, which is breathing out. And then when you're gonna take your spoonful, you're gonna cool the soup by breathing out. I said that wrong, breathing in and then breathing out. Another one is blowing bubbles. Um, that's another great way to practice breathing. And then just talking about breathing. Let's breathe together. We're going to count to three breathing in through our nose and then out through our mouth. And this not only helps your child, but if you're getting anxious in a situation, it's some it's a um, a way for you to help yourself become relaxed. Because parents get anxious as well when their child are going through different um, things at the doctor's office. Um, playing relaxing music is a way, another way to relax. And guided imagery is another way to um, have relax to um, use for relaxation. And guided imagery is a technique where you think about places that make you comfortable and calm. Um, so for example, if you love going to the beach, then 
you could do a guided imagery with your child and you have make sure they like to go to the beach too. Um, you could talk about how nice it is to lie in the sun on the beach and play with the sand with your toes and close your eyes and try to bring yourself to the beach. And that can help you relax just like you are actually sitting on the beach. So we're going to talk a little bit about making the appointment game plan, and we're going to talk about each of these. Um, making the plan is critical, um, and you, we need to think ahead of time about when to tell your child about the upcoming appointment, who should tell your child about the appointment, what to tell the child about the appointment, including being honest. If, um, if you're not sure what's going to happen, then tell them you don't know and that you can try to find out um, and never promise. And I'm going to say this multiple times, never promise that there won't be pokes. So when to tell. Um, it, this is sort of a, this depends a lot on your own child and you know how your child reacts if they do for a long time about things, you may want to adjust these time, these suggested times a bit to your own child. Um, but general guidelines for when to tell a child about an upcoming doctor's appointment is for preschoolers telling them one to two days in advance, for school age children, three to seven days in advance, and for teenagers, Generally, when you learn about the visit, that's a good time to tell them, unless again, they're the kind of kid that's gonna sit around for weeks and worry. Then you know your child the best. And so use your judgment and from past experience and decide what would probably work best. Other timing considerations for telling um, the child about and scheduling appointments is what is the best time of day for your child? When are they usually not really tired? They're in a good mood. They have a full belly. Um, that's a good time to schedule an appointment. It's also a good time to talk about an up upcoming appointment when you have time to deal with the feelings that may arise. So if you are going to tell your child about an appointment, it shouldn't be a minute before you're running to the grocery store. It should be a time when you can then respond to whatever their questions are and whatever their feelings they have. Um, times that aren't ideal are right before bedtime or nap time because then they may not sleep if they're worried. Um, definitely not on the way to an appointment. It's better to have to know in advance and make a plan um, about and we'll go into more details about what the plan should include. Um, it's really important not to be deceptive. Um, it's sometimes tempting if you can't get your kid to get in the car to go to the doctors, you could say, okay, we're gonna go to McDonald's. Um, and then you end up at the hospital. That's not gonna work because in the long run, then your child will never feel like they know that we're doing something fun versus something that they may fear. Um, and not pair it with other stressful events. So if you know there's something else going on in their life that they're worried about, that's not a good time to talk about the, um, the doctor's appointment. And finally, um, it's also not a good time to talk about or schedule appointments on special days for your child. So for example, not on their birthday. Um, you want their birthday to be just a happy day and the doctor's appointment can be a different day. So who should tell the child and how? So a supportive adult who can remain calm is the best person to tell a child. And if, if there's um, two people who are the caregivers of the child, the one who's most relaxed and calm could be the one to do it. If both or, or there's just one caregiver, the caregiver needs to uh, think about their own feelings and breathe and become calm before they approach the child and talk to them um, and do, practice some of the strategies that I just mentioned about being calm before you um, go and tell your kids. The other thing that, a, a, excuse me, is a decision is whether or not to tell them with a sibling around. So sometimes siblings can be very helpful. An older sibling might say, oh yeah, I went to the doctor last week and it was great. Or you can have a sibling that's going to tease them or tell them how you know, tell them bad things that maybe even aren't even true. So you need, you also know your other kids. So make a decision about what, what, who should be around when that information is shared. Um, you can use toys or visual aids um, or books um, and do it in a very comfortable setting. So for example, um, this woman and child are reading a book, lying in bed, and 
maybe they're reading a book about going to the doctor's office and they're going to talk about the fact that this little girl has a doctor's appointment tomorrow and they're reading about it and it's a comfortable, snuggly time together and makes it a very positive situation. So what do you tell your child about going to the doctor or the medical visit? Um, first, think about what information is something that they'll understand. Um, as children get older, they'll understand more, but we, you wanna make sure that you're you're telling them things that make sense to them and using words that don't have multiple meanings. For example, like diabetes, you don't, if, if you were to say that, um, you could ask the child, what do you think that means? And then you can find out whether or not they understand it or have a misconception. Um, and then consider whether your child benefits from a little bit of information or a lot of information. Some children love to know every detail about everything and other kids you know, or better just knowing, okay, we're going to the doctor. Um, and letting your child lead with the questioning gives you an idea of what information to give them and how much information. Um, if they start asking questions, then answer them. If they don't have a lot of questions and they seem comfortable with it, then that's fine. Um, typically, you do want to tell them that the name of the person and what they do, um, where that you're going to be going, and why it's necessary. Um, and then what will happen at the visit? And if you're not sure, you need to say, I'm not sure, but I'm going to call and ask. Um, again, we don't want to tell kids, even if the doctor says there's no plans for injections or blood draws, it's important not to tell your child that that's a definite no, because sometimes once in a while, a doctor will start to examine your child and find something that they don't expect and they need to do a blood test. And so we don't want to have kids shocked, you know, but you said we weren't going to have any um, blood tests or any needles. And so the answer should always be the plan right now, as long as everything goes smoothly, is that there won't be any needles. Um, and what information is not helpful to offer? These are things that younger kids, particularly with younger kids, that they won't even know about. So for example, if your child's going in for a procedure and going to be falling asleep, the only thing they really need to know is that you're going to be there before they fall asleep. You're going to be there when they wake up and they will wake up. And that if there's anything changes in their body. So if, they wake, if they're going to wake up with an IV, it's important for them to know that. If they're having surgery and going to have a bandage on their stomach, they need to know that. But what happened while they were sleeping really doesn't matter. And they don't have to think about that. So um, some things to do and don't for preparing. Um, the, um, so again... And we're emphasizing this a lot. Don't prom promise there won't be pokes or other experiences. We always have to wait and see. Um, and then don't allow your child to delay because of fear. A lot of kids will say, okay, we'll do it. We'll do it in five minutes. And if you wait five minutes, then they're going to say, okay, I need two more minutes. I need three more minutes. So it's best just to say, you know what? We're going to do this. We're going to get our vaccination. And then we're going to leave and we're going to go to the park. So let's just do it and get it done. Um, do be honest and talk about the visit with confidence in an upbeat way. Uh, one thing you can do, which is, can be fun and you can involve the child, is creating a coping toolbox. You can include um, different distraction items like an I spy book. You can also have games on your phone. Um, you can get small toys or fidget toys, stress balls. Um, there's lots of these little pop um, fidget toys. There's a picture on the screen of one of them. Um, even some soft clay that they can mush in their hands because that just like a stress ball will reduce anxiety. Um, the other thing you can do is um, look at the Boston Children's Hospital website has my hospital stories, which are social stories geared to children. And we're going to show you an example of one and how to get to it. Um, and this, and you can either use theirs or you can use theirs as a guide to making your own. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and Elise is going to take over and show you the My Hospital Stories. Excellent. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, here we go. So 
if you can, so if you can get to this page, which I believe we put in the links, it's a Boston Children's Hospital page. And then you, what you do is you can navigate down and you can see um, that, um, wow, this isn't the page I was exactly expecting. Just goes to show how hard it is to find things on our page. <laughs> um, but if we go to like, maybe it's meant to be, we find the patients and families. Well, oh, you know what? It might not let me do it. I'm sorry, guys, because I it, it won't let me navigate to another page. But what I'll tell you is, um, I'm going to stop sharing. We can go back to the other page. But I can say, if you go in, it, it won't let me share it right directly here. But if you go to the Children's Hospital page, and it will put the link in it, then you have a choice of going to Boston Children's Hospital or any of our satellites. You can see uh, what's going on. And then you can pick. They're often boy or girl. And then they'll show you what it's like to enter the hospital. Uh, what it's like to, um, you know, who you would see, what you would greet. The advantage to these pre-made patient resources, uh, my hospital stories, which if you go to this exact link, sorry, it wasn't up on my page to go there directly. I apologize for that. But if you go there, you'll see that you can pick a story and have a model who looks positive and happy going through each stage of what you would go through in a regular appointment, either whether it's urology or cardiology or whether you're getting a cast removed. Those are the kinds of pictures we have. And it's really helpful to read for a child in order to get them prepared to see what's gonna happen. And the model, again, is you can pick a boy or girl model for most of them. And I think that's helpful as well. But I wanna say a little bit more about coping toolboxes. And we had a very good question um, that relates to a lot of the information that we're providing. So how does this relate to a child who's nonverbal and doesn't really uh, play in a way that you can know what they're concerned about? This is a really good question. So I wanted to sort of include it in what we're thinking about. The first answer that we sort of think about in terms of medical play and how important it is, it depends on what your child can do. But even exposure and having kids have things around, like a real stethoscope or a syringe that you know, it looks like it's a medication, dispenser like you get with your, your your liquid Tylenol, but it looks a little bit like a syringe, like even playing with these things and getting exposure to them, it just makes it feel a little more comfortable when they see those items in the real appointment. So I think medical play is still a value. And if they can't represent it, you can use, as Gail has said, you can use those items to show what's going to happen in appointment. So you can say, depending on your child's level of understanding, oh, you know, the doctor will take the stethoscope and put it here and listen here. You can have a play blood pressure cuff. You know, we're not, we haven't talked about it, but kids are afraid of different things. And some kids are terrified of the blood pressure cuff. So even just having a play one around that you could know maybe because they're sad or cry and you've observed that having that item in your home that they can have and see and feel less threatened about can be a real value. And narrating what can happen with real objects or via a social story is often a very helpful thing to do. But I think all this, you know, using the less words your child has or less ability to express themselves through play and through words, the more your observational skills become key. That's noticing how they react to the appointment, both in the appointment and after really using your own information and your own uh, understanding of your child to plan and make that plan becomes more critical. So in the coping toolbox, just to say, it's, it can help to put in something new that they've never seen before that gathers their interest. But I also had a couple of kids who were nonverbal who wanted to bring the same toys every time or they appreciated having the same bag of toys each time they knew they associated that with going to the doctor. So uh, sometimes kids want to have a set things that those are their doctor or appointment play materials and sometimes novelty is what works best. And we also want you to think of the coping toolbox as not only things, these things are great to have, but also strategies for kids who are more able to use these kinds of strategies. And sometimes people make them concrete by putting a picture or writing them on a piece of paper. So it might be breathing or it might be um, uh, walk, pace, that could be a strategy or it could be um, move my hands. Whatever your child's strategy is to distract or to feel better, uh, sometimes having those in the toolbox is also useful. Uh, in terms of the social story, um, definitely use our website and also think about making your own. And if you make your own, sometimes people have seen these 
uh, these my hospital stories, and then they've engaged their kids in saying, how, how about if we made your hospital story and taking pictures or photos on their iPhone or whatever photographic device they have, camera device, taking pictures of their child at every step of the way to make their own. Sometimes people are really into that. And then you can also include the coping strategies that you're going to use or that you did use if you do it after the fact. Why don't we take a picture of you reading the book, your favorite book that you plan to bring? Why don't we take a picture of uh, you doing your deep breaths? Um, why don't we, and then afterwards you can add in a page and Billy got through the appointment really well. We figured out um, why his stomach was hurting and now we have a plan or something like that. So um, just, just as people have been very creative in their use of social stories. So also important is building a relationship with a provider. So um, on our, and when we start thinking about it, visits are always easier when you trust the people you're meeting with and the provider is aware of your child's fears or concerns. So sometimes if you tell them ahead, my child's really afraid of getting their blood pressure taken, uh, that helps them to be more sensitive if they know. And also you can say in the appointment, oh, wow, you can cue them by saying, uh, Janie is really uh, doing a good job. She, she's been practicing with our blood pressure cuff at home, however you want to sort of think about it. Um, also helping kids prepare questions in advance and be active in the relationship. So in the case of the heart valve, that really made a big difference to that child feeling confident going into that surgery. But you can also even think about questions, uh, other questions like, why do you need to know, uh, why is it important to know uh, what, what my blood says or something like that that they can ask? And building that little sense of advocacy early on for kids is, is important. And also what you don't do, if you have concerns about what's going on with a provider, to keep that with adults and not in children's world. If you say things like, uh, so-and-so is always late. Um, why did they say this? Or those kinds of things that creates more anxiety for the kids. Another just general concept to share is that medical people are here to help your child be as healthy as possible. And that's really their mission. So who should come to the appointment? Our, it, right now, our hospital is only allowing two people to come, which is a shame because sometimes it was nice to have three. But right now, that's what we're living with in our COVID world and our contagion world. But that said, it's very helpful if you can have two people come, in part to have a helper wait in the waiting room with, with the child if information is being shared that the child is better off not hearing or is just too complex for the child or is going to use their attention span. They don't have the attention span for it. So having that helper uh, with you to go and spend time in the waiting room allows you to really more openly share your questions with a provider. I've seen people who can't do this because they simply both can't take off of work, um, have things like um, earphones and say to the child, hey, why don't you watch this on the iPad while I'm having adult conversation with the provider? So. Uh, just be cautious. It does sometimes make kids anxious to hear information that's beyond their developmental ability to manage it. Um, but also, you might have to bring siblings to the appointment. You might not have a choice. But if you do have a choice, I think about whether that sibling is helpful or whether they increase the child's stress. Sometimes siblings are very distracting and can play with a child. And sometimes it's frankly helpful for the sibling to see that their sibling is getting care as well. But if they tease or take your attention, if you have an option, I wouldn't bring them. So during the visit, we're just really, it's so important what uh, caregivers do. Your actions really matter and um, how you present it to your kids can really, really help. So being present and focused on the child. We, we know, um, I know from being a parent myself, I get anxious when there is an appointment, especially when something serious is being discussed. But as much as you can keep your focus on the child as opposed to both of you being in your own uh, electronic or whatever kind of world you get into, um, showing interest and putting those distractions away unless you're using them with your child is very important while waiting for an appointment. Modeling good coping strategies, especially um, if you're nervous, but even if you're not saying, I'm gonna take a few deep breaths, I'm gonna think about the questions I'm gonna ask, whatever else you can do to um, show that, that, there, that some of these strategies really work. And now we're asking you to go through the eye of a needle and not over reassure. So here's if you're saying things like, it's really going to be okay. I promise it's really, really going to be okay. That actually is more anxiety provoking than it is reassuring because it sort of signals there's a lot of anxiety. So as much as you can just be to the point, hey, we're here in the appointment. I know you're nervous. 
hey, let's see what the doctor has to say, that kind of neutral tone if you can. So he, the, here's where it's most important. So during and after the visit, um, you've made a social story and a coping toolbox, hopefully, and even if the, sometimes things in the coping toolbox are for you, let's just put it out there. You feel better with something, you bring that thing that you feel better about for you. you we're people too. You need to think about what's going to help you do your best. Um, so putting your pl child's plan into action and your plan into action is really important. So a big part of that plan is usually distraction in the coping toolbox and letting that, letting that take action and help and providing the realistic choices is also in the toolbox. Relaxation also put this all into action. Then there are some things we haven't spoken about yet, such as pairing uh, an appointment with more pleasant things. So if they get a new, uh, a new something, that's pairing it with something pleasant. If you're reading to them, that's pleasant. That's why sometimes people like to visit, if they're at the main hospital, visit the musical, musical steps. That's something that kids see as very pleasant and fun. So pairing a visit with things that they find enjoyable. Then there's also bridging, which is thinking about what's gonna happen after the appointment. So the child's also not only thinking about here I am now, but what's gonna happen next. So even if it's when we get in the car afterwards, let's listen to your favorite radio station, or it, it can even be, it doesn't have to be pleasant, so pleasant. It could also be, hey, when we're done with the appointment, we'll go pick up your younger sibling, that kind of thing. So letting them know that what's going to happen. And if your child's coming in for a surgery or something that's going to take longer, they're going to be inpatient. Even if you say, oh, after you go in and you're going to have um, your heart valve um, replaced, then when you wake up, I'll see you and I can't wait to see you and talk to you and read you this book or listen to your favorite music, whatever else it's going to be. So um, after the appointment, sometimes people like to give e a, a, some kind of prize and um, non-contingent just means they get the prize, whatever they did. It's not for specific behavior. We finished the appointment. We're getting, uh, we're going to the park. We're getting a cookie where whatever, we're listening to the radio, whatever it is versus also, um, or they earn a reward because they listened or because they tried. We wanna be careful not to make those rewards for things like not crying that might be out of their control. If it's something that's in their control that they can do like walking in the office or trying to listen, um, those kinds of things can, uh, you can give them a reward. Keep it small though, if you're gonna give them uh, a new car because of their behavior, that signals that the going to the doctor or the visit was very hard. So keep it something small. Also in general, it's good at, if you can do something fun after the appointment that lets a child have something to look forward to, whether it's a stop at the park, an extra bedtime story, playing a game at home, whatever it is. Uh, and also to build coping skills after the appointment, that's where you remind them of the things that went well and say, wow, that was, that, was that hard for you or not? Was it as hard as you expected? Look how we did the breathing, reminding them again of the things that uh, were in the toolbox and in the social story and how they went. So in the hospital setting, um, not as much in pediatric offices, offices um, there are lots of people that potentially can be helpers. Um, and we've listed a few that are um, available in different situations at Boston Children's Hospital. Um, child life specialists are um, there clinically trained to help children who are in various areas of the hospital. There is not one for every area, but there are many. Um, and what they, what their basic job is to help children cope with the situation, to do therapeutic play, to help them understand what's happening, um, explain what's going on in a, a child-friendly manner, um, making sure that they don't have misconceptions about what's going to happen, because as we mentioned before, um, words can have double meanings, and we want to make sure that they understand what the true the meaning is in the context of the hospital. Um, child life specialists will prepare children for procedures and talk about what each step is going to happen. Um, they can offer distraction, just like you can with your um, toolbox that you can put together with your child. Um, and the other thing is to offer children, um, a lot of child life specialists and doctors and nurses try very hard, um, and medical people try hard to give children choices that are realistic. So there's a tendency to say is, okay, um, we're gonna do your blood pressure now, okay? Well, if you say okay at the end of the sentence, 
but that means they can say no. So it's better to say, um, or a more efficient way to say it would be, which arm would you like to use for your blood pressure? Would you like to do it on your right arm or your left arm? There is no, no answer in that, but it is allowing them to feel like they're having some choices. And it can be simple things like which arm, what color Band-Aid, um, do you want to sit on the table or on my lap? Um, those are things that help children feel in control. Um, at the hospital, there's also music therapists and art therapists, and there's a pet visit program, a, um, dogs that are, um, the program is called Paw Prince. Those um, programs generally are for kids who are inpatient or are coming for an appointment that has an extended amount of time. So for example, if your child is coming in for an infusion that's gonna take two hours, you might be able to call and say, I've heard there's music therapy or art therapy or pets, would it be possible for us to have one of those? It's not always possible because it's a big hospital and very busy um, and there's a lot of demand for these things, but it never hurts to ask and whoever's, running the program always will do their best to try to accommodate you. Annie? Thank you. So um, clinical social workers and spiritual care providers are very helpful people, non-threatening, both offer non-threatening presence in medical situations, um, certainly available in the hospital, um, in patient as well as in most of our clinics, but in some settings outside in the community, there are certainly clinical social workers um, available. And social workers are trained in psychotherapy, um, but also just to be there for supportive counseling. And as with spiritual care providers as well, like sometimes it's just really nice in terms of relationships in the clinic, in the setting, to develop nice relationships with some more people um, in that setting that provide some calm and a sense of being known um, for the child and the family. Spiritual care providers, um, again, provide support. And although they don't have to be religious in nature, if there are um, religious rituals that help keep the child um, and family feel calm, um, they can participate in that as well and be supportive. And Elisa will talk to us a little bit about psychologists in this setting. Yeah, so psychologists, um, you can see a psychologist at Boston Children's Hospital or in your local community. They often help with uh, specific fears, can be very helpful with that, as can clinical social workers. Some of our, um, some of our, some, at some places in the hospital, they do have psychologists that specifically can see your child for a course of treatment, especially around pain or, um, uh, in the GI department, but you can also go to our psychiatry department where you could see um, a social worker or a psychologist for more extended work around some of these kinds of worries. And when and how or why would you want to see someone or when would therapy be indicated? Um, your child might need expert mental health care around their medical worries if if you just can't get them the medical care they need because they're too distressed. If you're thinking, wow, I can't get them here to this appointment, then that's a problem. We need them to be able to get the care they need to have their bodies be healthy. And part of that is dealing with their mental health concerns about it. Um, how can you know if they might need this or if they have a, you know, more worry than you think they should? One, if the thoughts of visits are affecting their sleep, their eating, their energy, their development, their look regressed. Um, again, if that worry is beyond what you think it should be for someone uh, their age, and if the crying or uh, distress about appointments continues beyond what's appropriate. So several days later, they're still crying. Um, also, if they're having a lot of nightmares, it's important to pay attention to this. Um, also, if you're not seeing progress in their ability to manage their worry, it's worth it to ask your uh, primary care physician or, um, or, or gain a, an, at least an evaluation by a mental health professional. So as we mentioned, there's lots of resources out there to help your child um, with medical visits. As um, we said, there's a ton of books about different characters going to the, um, the doctor's office. If your child has a, a favorite um, 
TV character, you can Google and see if there's a book about them. For example, Elmo goes to the doctor or Winnie the Pooh gets a checkup. Bernstein bears go to the doctor. There's also 15, um, there's a website that's 15 books for kids about the doctor. And it's called She Got, she got Guts. Um, Daniel Tiger Visits the Doctor is another favorite book. For older children, um, there are books about their bodies um, to help them understand what their body changes that are going on. Um, Scholastic Discover More, My Body is One, My First Human Body Book, um, Human Anatomy for Kids, uh, Teen Our Body Ourselves, and Care and Keeping of You, which is American Girl Books. Um, many of these are available at local libraries. Um, so you can look at them over, um, share from the library or purchase them if you feel like that's something you want for your child to have in their library. Um, there are also other books um, and some of these are listed in the chat, um, these websites, um, children's books that explore medical needs. That's a website that has a list of books um, and 10 great children's books for talking about surgery, sickness, and feelings. That's also a website that has access to books. And finally, when we talk about um, playing with a medical kit, there's um, some DIY medical equipment um, links that are that we shared. One is to make a stethoscope and another is to make a syringe. So if your child loves arts and crafts, it might be even nicer and more fun to make a stethoscope and make a syringe out of paper and have their own little medical kit that they've done. Um, there's also websites that use car teaches you how to use cardboard boxes to make a hospital and an ambulance. Um, so those are all things that could be medical play that are just from things you have around the house. Um, so you don't need to go, you know, spend a lot of money to have access to medical play. And the other thing that is online, which are fun, um, I'm probably a lot of you who have little children may have heard of Coco Melon Nursery Rhymes. Um, they have one that's a doctor checkup song, which is very cute. And the Bernstein Bears Goes to the Doctor is a video um, that talks about the doctor in a very positive manner. But for all of these, for the books, the videos, it's important that you take some time to look at them or read them over to make sure that they're good, a good fit with your child. Because sometimes, you know, when you read the book and you see that um, they're talking about only healthy kids and your child has a significant health problem, that might not be a good choice for your child. So look them over, even just, you know, scan through them and find the books that will work for your child and have a positive influence on your child based on their personality. So, Annie. Thanks, so we have a couple of very good questions here. Um, and I think the first one, maybe we can each address it. Uh, it says, my daughter only really goes inpatient, but has so many specialists that we're usually at outpatient clinics a couple times a month. This is of course very common for a lot of kids to have lots of specialists. What, um, if any, of uh, day of support is, it sounds like means actually is available to us since it's, it's, uh, the question is, is child life primarily for inpatient stays? So Gail, I'm going to ask you to address um, the child life piece of what's available, but I will say um, if you don't have a relationship with a social worker in your clinic, and many clinics here at Boston Children's do have social workers and psychologists, you can call in advance um, and let them know you're coming in and would like to meet them. I do know that if um, your child would benefit from the Paw Prince program, um, you can contact the Hale Family Center for Families and Paw Prints can be booked in advance because um, they do know when the dogs and the handlers are coming in, if that's something fun for your child. Um, if you know in advance, contact the Hale Family Center for Families. Um, I'll put the number here um, to contact Paw Prints and let them know. There are only some clinics, I guess, that the dogs can't go to, but they would let you know that. Gail, can I pass um, Can I pass sure. a question to you about yeah. availability, of availability of child life? So it is accurate that most inpatient areas do have child life specialists, and there are some 
outpatient areas that have child life specialists. Um, one thing that you can do to find out is to contact the child life special uh, child life department um, and ask if there's one available. Um, and again, it depends on where you're going. There, um, I believe that GI has a child life specialist. Um, outpatient cardiology has a child life specialist. Um, oncology has outpatient child life specialists. And I honestly am not sure about the status of the other areas at this time. There used to be one. It was actually me in ophthalmology, dermatology, and dentistry, but I'm not sure what um, where, where they're at. I know they're constantly trying to add child life specialists to different outpatient areas. And if they're requested and get feedback enough from parents, it may actually help to be able to um, encourage the hospital to hire more child life specialists for those areas. So asking the question and then writing a note saying, you know, it'd be really helpful for us if we had a child life specialist in this area um, can only help to grow the department and to potentially get child life specialists in our outpatient areas where many children would benefit a great deal. Thanks. We have a couple more questions. Um, this is, do you know of any resources? Do you have any resources for knowing if nonverbal toddler age kiddos need mental health or somatic support for traumatic medical appointments and what that support might look like? That's a big question. Well, you know, it's really hard. Sometimes it's so, it's so hard with the toddlers who aren't verbal. We don't, it's hard to know what what they're thinking or what they're feeling, but you can tell that, you know, if they're distressed and they have a regression and they're functioning. Um, there are some particular programs that focus specifically on infants and toddlers. One that I really like is called the Rice Center. And its whole goal is to work in the zero to six population uh, for mental health needs. And that, that, that they're, um, they keep changing who their affiliated agency is. But if you look up the Rice Center, uh, you should be able to find them. That, that's their whole specialty. Because a lot of people don't want to do the play therapy or want to work with um, really young kids. Sometimes if it's uh, significant enough, you can also get an early intervention evaluation for the birth to three population, see how your child is doing, have an evaluation. Um, and, and some of that is, of course, mental health, but also if they're having, sometimes when you've had a lot of medical procedures and you're a really little kid, it can, you know, mm -hmm. You know, it can't, it doesn't always, but it can impact your development and getting that evaluation can make you feel better to, to know what you're doing or how you're managing it. Thanks. Um, also, there's a related question, which is, are there times when you shouldn't complete a procedure because your child is too upset, such as blood draws that require parents or care and care caregivers to hold them down excessively, which we, boy, we really don't like to do that. Um, are there times when you can't follow through when it can't be done? Well, that's certainly not what we're certainly aiming against that. I think part of the question is you have to work with your medical team about that because if it's a really, it's a question like, if it's not that essential blood work, it's a lot different than if it's extremely essential and we need to know that in order to proceed with other medical care that's essential. I think part of it depends on how essential is that procedure. And that's something to talk about with your medical provider uh, but I've certainly um, over time had opportunities to say, let's not do that now, let's build up to that. So I've had a couple of kids over time that were really afraid of blood draws. So we did a whole exposure program to build up to where they felt more confident to do it. So we didn't do it immediately because they had been so distressed and they had been held down, which became more of a traumatic event. So we sort of had a game plan of uh, you know, a, a treatment program to get uh, to feel better about it and to um, have, do some exposure to the situation, do some play, and the question of whether you add in medication. I think you need to work with your providers to figure out how to make it happen and whether that's mental health care, medication care, exposure, treatment, whatever it is. But I think the biggest question is, you know, working with the medical provider, recommending that intervention, how critical it is. You as a caregiver can advocate for pain medicine before they have a blood draw and that can make the situation much better. So um, just ask whoever's ordering that blood draw to also give you some um, topical numbing medicine. Do everything you can to make it feel better. And of course, we never like to see kids held down or feeling so upset about a procedure. That's certainly yeah. never, never ideal. 
We thank you so much for coming today and joining us um, for this talk. And we hope it's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.